Chris Brown, I'm a writer from here in Austin. It's my great pleasure to uh, uh, have you all join me in welcoming to Austin my good friend Nisi Shaw, visiting from Seattle here uh, as part of the tour. I guess the first traveling uh, uh, show on her tour to launch her amazing new book, Everfair. Um, I got to know Nisi over the past couple of years, uh, most notably as a contributor to this amazing anthology. She and uh, Bill Campbell from Rosarian Books put together uh, Stories for Chip, this uh, Samuel Delaney uh, tribute anthology that was published last year to wide acclaim. And I got a sense from that of her skills and communicative gifts. Um, and. Uh, uh, but you know she's really so well known as an editor and anthologist across so many fields and across so many topics. But probably best known as a short story writer. And I realized while I was sort of reading through her biography that I've been reading her since her first publication, which I was very excited to know when she read her first story it was in Semiotext. Yes. Stuff, which is this like amazing seminal coolest ever kind of avant pop uh, bit of science fiction, along with other. Uh, amazing luminaries. Um, and uh, uh, Nisi was a winner uh, uh, for her short fiction, specifically her collection, uh, Filter House of the 2008 James Tiptree, Tiptree Jr. Award, mm -hmm. uh, which is given to works of speculative fiction that explore and expand the boundaries of gender. Really, a really important award in the field. And she also, I think, twice was nominated for the World Fantasy Award, including for uh, uh, her novella, Good Boy. Um, uh, Nisi's also an amazing teacher, critic, and sort of exemplar within our community of writers and readers, uh, known for really pioneering efforts of promoting diversity in the field, um, especially through her book, Writing the Other, and the seminars uh, she does under the same name with her co-author, sometimes uh, Cynthia uh, Ward, and, and um, it's really kind of a singularly important work that's had a huge impact on the field and in getting people to think more broadly about um, you know, how to approach issues of diversity and the construction of imaginary worlds and characters in a way that's both really important for the work and really important for the world in which we live. It's a kind of a singular contribution. But of course, tonight we're here to celebrate and talk about and hear uh, uh, from the launch of Nisi's first novel, despite all of this amazing body of work to date, Everfair, uh, which was just published this week by Tor, uh, the science fiction imprint of Macmillan. And Everfair imagines a utopian community carved from King Leopold's Belgian Congo, a counterfactual that I think is a lot far more real world analogs than you might know, uh, and uh, just a sort of astonishing work uh, of. Uh, uh, covering an incredible array of material and characters with a remarkable economy of prose that I'm really excited about. It's no surprise that Publishers Weekly gave it a starred review. Uh, all sorts of glowing reviews have been, reviews have been pouring in, and uh, Gary Wolf of Locus aptly said, the novel unfolds with deep intellect, epic sweep, and an unsentimental historical insight that remains all too rare in the genre. So please join me in welcoming Nisi. Hi, you guys. <laughs> um, what Chris didn't tell you is that I also sing, and I like to get other people to sing with me. So tonight, you guys are going to be singing with me. Uh, I wrote a couple of verses to uh, Everfair's national anthem, and I'm going to ask you guys to help me with the chorus. You just have to sing. Three syllables, <laughs> three notes, one word, and I will cue you and conduct you um, when it's time to do that. Because it takes place, uh, the singing takes place in a couple of the sections that I've got here to read. So, you guys are ready, right? Good, then I'll be ready too. Um, all right, so. All you have to do is sing ever fair. That's good. <laughs> One more time. Alright. So just when I can 
got you, that's what we'll be doing. <laughs> Next, I have a question, which I probably know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Should I read uh, something from the beginning of the book, or should I read a sex scene from in the middle of the book? <laughs> <laughs> Which one has more singing? <laughs> oh, believe me, they both have singing. <laughs> Whatever you want. No spoilers. Should we do both? Beginning. There would be no spoilers in, in, the, in the middle of the book. I promise that. Well, it sounds like the second one would have sheep. <laughs> I think I'm glad I missed that. <laughs> no, I seriously, I it's it's I'm gonna be doing this for a while, so you guys, what do you want to hear? Beginning. Beginning, alright. <laughs> this is from uh, all the chapters have headings that are like the date and place, not very exciting. 50 kilometers out of Matadi, Congo, July 1894. To Jackie Owen, the way seemed arduous and long. During this time, miscalled the dry season, the Congo sweltered in humidity comparable to the Gold Coasts. The wet air corroded everything. The rank vegetation smoked almost as much as it burned when fed into the expedition's small boilers. So they're on their way to uh, settle Everfair, and they're trekking through the, the jungle. Chester and Winthrop had had the ride of, of their steam bicycles. Um, they were destined for greatness. The traction engines did well enough over terrain recently cleared for the construction of a railroad, but that would end. The broad way they traveled would narrow to a mere footpath ahead, up where the Macau coolies had their camp. And for now, the ground continued to rise. Jackie turned to look back along the procession following him. Line of sight ended after only a dozen men, but his elevation allowed him glimpses of those further behind. Beside the three heavy traction engines, the baker's dozen of bicycles valiantly pulled more than their own weight. English workers and natives took turns shepherding the narrow wheeled baskets trundling in the bicycles' wakes. Clouds, of, clouds from their boilers diffused into the mist spiraling up from the jungle's relentless green. But why was that last machine's plum, plume so much thicker than the rest? Hurriedly, he signaled a halt and went back down to investigate. Winthrop was there ahead of him. The regulator's faulty, Mr. Owen. Is it possible to repair? It must be replaced. I'll take care of it. We have a spare one? The stocky Negro nodded at the first wheeled basket in the steam bicycle's train. Several. He leaned forward and began to unpack a wooden chest. I'll finish tonight. Jackie continued to the end of the halted line, explaining the problem. As he had expected, the natives received the news with stoicism. Since the expedition didn't require them to kill themselves with the effort of hauling its luggage up to the river's navigable stretches, they found no fault in however th else things were arranged. The women were another matter. The Albans governess, Mademoiselle Lisette Toutonnier, still held the handlebars of the steam bicycle she had appropriated at the journey's outset. How is this? We lack at least two hours till darkness, and you call a stop? For some reason that escaped him, the French girl challenged Jackie at every opportunity. Daisy Alban's anxiety was understandable. She had left the children behind in Boma with their father, Laurie. The sooner the expedition reached their lands beyond the Kasai River, the sooner she would be able to establish a safe home for them there. Are you sure you couldn't find a more inconvenient camping ground? Her rueful grin took away the word sting. Jackie reconsidered the surroundings. The considerable slope was more than an engineering obstacle. It might indeed prove difficult to sleep or pitch a tent upon. If we proceed with less equipment, should we not meet with a better location? 
Mademoiselle Tutournier's wide gray eyes unnerved him with their steady gaze. Jackie shuddered at the thought of the women striking out on their own, meeting with un unmanageable dangers such as poisonous snakes or a colonial police. He had opposed their presence on the expedition as strongly as possible without making a churl of himself or intimating that they were somehow inferior to men. That would be contrary to the principles upon which the Fabian Society was formed. The third woman, Mrs. Hunter, approached, accompanied by Wilson and Chester, the other of her godsons. I would like to introduce a suggestion. Jackie steeled himself to reject an unreasonable demand of one sort or another, a night march, several hours retreat to a site earlier passed by. Perhaps we would do better not to sleep at all. Reverend Wilson and I have been thinking to hold a prayer meeting, a, a revival, and there's no time like the present. We might easily, Jackie paid no heed to the rest of the woman's argument. Yes, the idea had its merits, but proselytizing a religion? We are part of a socialist expedition. He could tell by Mrs. Hunter's expression he had inter interrupted a sentence. He went on, nonetheless, if I put the issue to a vote, do you think a prayer meeting will be the choice of the majority? I, I believe most of my countrymen to be decent, God-fearing Christians. These are your countrymen. Jackie swung one arm wide to indicate everyone in their immediate vicinity and beyond. Not only those who came with you from America, but all now on the expedition. Catholics, skeptics, atheists, savages as well. Do you not count your African brother's opinion as mattering? Shall we canvass their number for a suitable spokesman to explain to us the spirits lodged in the trees and bushes? I venture to, yes. Yes, you venture, you venture forth into a new life, a new home, a new country, a new countrymen. If only he could bring the colony's expedition to some sort of coherence, to unity, then the white sacrifice would mean so much more. What would that take? Mrs. Hunter turned to Wilson. But our aim is to build a sanctuary for the soul, isn't it? As well as for our mere physical victims of the tyrant's cruelty. Wilson nodded. Yes, we must consider all aspects of our people's well-being. What had Jackie expected? The man was a minister, after all. Though he had agreed to the society's project of colonization as Jackie, their president, had extended it. In the end, the plan was for a series of gatherings up and down the trail. Mrs. Hunter decided she and Wilson would harangue all three parties in turn. Each was centered loosely around one of the traction engine's boiler furnaces. They began with their countrymen. The Negroes grouped together at the procession's rear. Jackie had done his utmost to integrate the expedition's various factions, but to no avail. The Christian's message, from all he could tell, contradicted none of the Fabian Society's ostensible reasons for crossing the Kasai River, only casting them in the light of a mandate from heaven. He listened a short while to what Mrs. Hunter and Wilson preached. Then he preceded them to the British and Irish workmen clustered around the middle boiler, whose participation in the society's experiment he insisted on, gambling that, in the eyes of the audience he had in mind, the workmen's race would trump white Europeans' objections to their class. Though for many years an office holder in the Fabian organization, Jackie Owen was no public speaker. As an author, the written word was what he normally relied on and he hoped what would soon attract the attention this project had been set up to generate. Given the circumstances, he did his best. He made sure the firelight fell on his face. Practical dreamers, said, that's what we are, dreamers, but realistic about it. Heads in the clouds, but our feet are on the ground. He saw their eyes glittering, but little else. You've come this far, abandoned your homes, left your wives behind. Well, most of them had. 
trusting me, trusting in your own right hand, the work you do, the work that has made the world and will now make it anew. He paused. What was there to say? Nothing that could be said. In the distance behind him, he heard music, church songs, provoking and invoking primal reactions with pitch and rhythm. How could he fight that? He couldn't. But the men listening, maybe they could. If I stood here all night, I wouldn't be able to convey to you one half of what I aim for us to accomplish in our new home, liberated from the constraints of capitalism and repressive governments. I know many of you are eager to share your own ambitions for our endeavor, and I invite you to do so now. Now is the time. He called on a workman whose name he remembered from a recruitment meeting. Albert, step up and tell your fellows about that flanging contraption you're wanting to rig up. Me? Yes, yes, you, come up here and talk a bit. Albert obliged, stepping into the furnace's fire's ruddy glow with his jacket and shirt wide open to the heat and insects. Self-educated, of course. Still, he had some highly original ideas on how to revise manufacturing processes for an isolated colony. But as his eyes adjusted to the darkness beyond the boiler's immediate vicinity, Jackie saw the audience's interest was not much more than polite. Music exercised its all too potent charms. Heads nodded, hands tapped against thighs, necks and shoulders swayed, and he thought they'd be singing themselves at any moment. The song ended before that happened, though. Albert finished his discourse in silence and stood in the furnace's light without, evidently, any idea of what to do next. Thank you, Albert, said Jackie. This elicited light applause and gave Albert the impetus he needed to find and resume his old place among the onlookers. Just as Jackie was wondering who next to impose upon for a testimonial, the music began again. No, not again. Not the same music from the same source. This came from the other end of their impromptu encampment, from the head of the procession, where the natives had gathered by the boiler furnace of the first traction engine, where Mademoiselle Tutunier had insisted on remaining with Mrs. Alban, intent on remaining with her. A lyric soprano sang a song he'd never heard that was somehow hauntingly familiar from its opening notes. <laughs> ever fair, ever fair my home, ever fair land so sweet. A simple melody. It was winning in its self-assurance, comforting, supportive, like a boat rowed out on a smooth, reflective sea. Then it rose higher, plaintive in a way that made one want to satisfy the singer. Ever are you calling home your children? We hear an answer swiftly as thought as fleet. A chorus of lower voices Altos, tenors, and baritones repeated the whole thing. Then the earlier voice returned in a solo variation on the theme. Tyrants and cowards, we fear them no more. Ever Behold, your power protects us from harm. by an inevitable foundation, a foundation that was repeated as the re resolution necessary for the verse's last line. He was staring through the darkness at the little light piercing it ahead. So he felt sure were all those with him. The chorus repeated, graced this time by bells, gongs, 
singing the second verse and a third one. And by then he was on the edge of the circle with Daisy Alban and the lead engine at its center. She said, she it must be who had penned the words, taught them by rote, composed the music in which the entire expedition now took part. The bells and gongs revealed themselves to be pieces of the traction engine struck as ornament and accent to the anthem's brave and stately measures. The anthem, this was it, their anthem. Before they'd even arrived home, they sang their nation's song and knew its name, Ever Fair Land. This would be what was lost, what roused all Europe to revenge it. Mrs. Alban had stopped. The chorus continued. Jackie made his way through the happy singing throng to clasp and kiss her hands. That's it, Jackie. just a little bit from later in the novel. Um, it's, this novel is written from 11 viewpoints, okay? <laughs> there are 11 viewpoint characters. And um, that was from the point of view of Jackie, who is sort of modeled on uh, George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells, sort of a mashup of those two. <laughs> uh, this section is from the point of view of Wendy, who comes to Everfair as a refugee. Um, pretty much she and her great uncle are the only ones who survived. Um, and she stays in Everfair, uh, grows up, and becomes sexually and romantically involved with a white man named Maddie, who is modeled on J.M. Barry. <laughs> There's a pun there, but we won't go into that. Uh, Wendy, um, Mombasa, Kenya, September 1915. Should she tell Maddie? Wendy had never explained to anyone how she rode the cats. Grandmother's brother McCoy knew. He protected her secret. But he'd always known. Her parents must have told him. Her parents, or at least one of them, must have been the same as she was. This was her room as much as his. No, I'm sorry, I'll skip that. Uh, she sighed and rolled gently to the hotel bed's edge. Maddie barely stirred. He'd grown used to her leaving him in the middle of the night like this. Her shift in robe lay where she'd left them, carefully folded and stacked on the chair at the bed's foot. She dressed in the dark and felt her way to the window. She pushed open the shutters. For a moment, the only light she saw came through the few high windows of the Colonial Administration Building across Kisumu Road, indicating rooms where an official worked late hours, perhaps for Everfair's downfall. downfall. Then the clouds parted, and the white moon shone invitingly. She stepped onto the room's balcony as soft winds swept her cheeks. Closing the shutters behind her, she began softly to sing. The carved stone railing felt cool against her arms as she leaned forward, crooning, calling. Soon, the first cat came, into the, came onto the pavement below. Then three more, then another three. That should be enough. Mm -hmm. Wendy changed her song, her voice lowering, deepening. Up the vine, clinging to the hotel's walls, they climbed. She sank back into the chair she kept waiting there as the gathering cats perched one by one on the balustrade. The lamplight spilling from the fire building helped her see their coloring. Two ginger, and two gray tabbies, a black, a black and white, and one other poor thin animal darkly mottled like Lisette's treasured tortoise shell powder compact. Her singing dropped to a whisper. To hear her better, it seemed, the cats came forward and nestled around her feet, on the chair's back, even on her lap. Stroking their dirty fur, she saw fleas leaping before her fingers. She would have to bathe in the morning 
as always. The song still became nothing but breath. The cat's breathing matched twenties. She let her eyelids flutter shut. The pleasant drowsiness filled her. As tempting as the idea of resting in this place all night was, her work beckoned. She entered the cat's heads. When Fuente was little, she'd only ridden a single cat at a time. Partly this was because wild cats lived more solitary lives than their domesticated counterparts. By the time they reached Alexandria, she graduated to prides of up to 11. Lisette smiled and, and um, Lisette smiled indulgently and helped her feed her strays, noting almost casually that all limped slightly and most seemed to be queens rather than toms. Her mounts lowered themselves back down the creeping vine. With practice, Wendy had become proficient in maintaining multiple viewpoints, though this was easier when dipping only lightly into the senses of all but a very few. So the spinning panorama of leaves and stucco and shadows, the dew-slick cobbles, and sweet-smelling sewers under paw passed almost unnoted by Fuente as she herded her pride toward their goal, the British administration's offices on the other side of the road. She was her country's best spy. It was she who'd stolen that patent application for an automatically firing weapon. All the building's doors were locked and guarded. That didn't matter in the least. Wendy sent her mounts to the building's back. She let them take turns licking oily puddles and tipping over lidded baskets filled with a tasty refuse while she surveyed the scene. Of course, to anyone ignorant of her abilities, Wendy would appear to be asleep on the hotel balcony, and Maddie could testify innocently to that effect if the question arose. She left this nearest target till late in their visits, though, just in case. No plants had been allowed to gain purchase on the pale, smooth walls, naturally. The royal governor was not that sort of fool. And neighboring trees had been trimmed back so that not even a boy could use them to gain access. But she could see a branch that would bear a lesser weight. She left the black and white to act as sentry, reinforcing its appetite and playing up the attractions of the Feast of Scraps. The others, she took up the tree. The flexing limb end deposited each in turn on the deep sill of the third floor window, which soon became crowded. The room was dark behind the ill-fitting the Ill shutters. Fuente had the tortoise shell pry these apart, far enough to slip in. With its nose, it searched for and found the latch, a hook, which she had it lift away. Cats and moonlight poured into the abandoned office. Through wide irises, Fuente saw a desk piled with stacks of paper. She left the youngest tabbies up to where she could have them read any document of interest. Ah, orders for the touring company's detention and the arrest of herself, Lisette, Rima, Maddie, a citizen of the Crown, to be simply interviewed. Dated for tomorrow, no, today. She could wake the others to pack and escape on her return, but it would be best to offer them some proof of what would seem unfounded fears. With claws and teeth, she made the, order, she made the orders into a neat scroll and sent them off to her human body in the mouth of the young gray. Five cats left to explore with. None of the other documents that had been left unsecured were of interest. She had to make the most of this sole excursion. She hurried her mounts to the door and successfully coordinated their efforts to turn its knob. The lighted and no doubt occupied room she noticed earlier lay down the corridor to the left and around a corner. She remembered where it should be and heard the low, steady murmur of men in discussion. Three of them, too many. Heading to the right inside the tortoise shell and remaining tabbies, she bade the black stay behind to watch their path of retreat. But she returned within minutes, having drawn a blank in that direction. In every room, the desks were bare, the cabinets locked, or more difficult to open than her mounts could handle in the time Fuendi felt remained. She released the tabbies with an urging to join the black and white below. They left. The rest of the building was silent, empty, she was sure. 
Riding only the tortoise shell and the black, she crept toward the conversing men. The cat's ears heard what was said long before there was any danger of being seen. Don't take our efforts seriously. That experimental gun that brought down a dirigible over Lake Victoria, not being replaced. They as much as admit Europe is all the bloody government cares about. If Portugal would declare for the Entente, or America, that would finish things off. Fuente recognized only one of the speakers, Lord, quote unquote, Delamere, the lion killer. Before she could stop herself, she hissed with hatred. <sighs> what was that? What do you mean? That sound. Footsteps, a door opening, louder now. Wendy ran the cats back toward the room they'd entered through. Too late, gunfire, her ears, a second shot. She reached the empty room, but only in one body. She'd lost control of the tortoise shell. It must be dead. The shutters hung invitingly open, but Fwendi cowered safely beneath the desk. The door slammed back, and the men rushed in with a lamp. Her irises turned to slits. Did you miss? This was said in a high boyish, uh, high boyish voice. Not I. That was Lord Delamere. But I thought there was another black bad luck bugger. Search the room. What do you want to kill cats for? Mightn't they be someone's pets? The third man asked. Didn't mean to do more than frighten either one. But when I saw them, it gave me a funny feeling. Superstitious, asked the boyish voiced man. Superstitions, nothing to laugh at in Africa, asserted the third man. Fwendi had to decide how to distract them from searching the room. They'd find out the arrest orders were missing. There was only one horrible solution. Maybe it wouldn't work out so badly. It was only a few feet from her hiding place to the window. She dashed for freedom, pausing only an instant at the windowsill to calculate her jump onto the thin, thin branch. Taken by surprise, Delamere had no time to aim well. He missed. Unfortunately, so did Fwendi. The branches she encountered on her way to the ground broke not her fall, but her bones. question or two and but we've got such a great group of people here I hope you all have better questions than me that was pretty amazing thank you there's I wrote down a new country it's that very concept a new country liberated from the constraints of capitalism and I guess colonialism it's a pretty exciting and ambitious narrative undertaking a brave one right Okay. What was the, what was the, it seems that way to me, and, and uh, what was the, but what was the, sort of the, the kernel of the idea? Where did you kind of start from to, to take on such a kind of epic project? There was this panel at World Fantasy. Um, like you said, a couple of things had been nominated, and I was on, on this panel because I had to go last minute. They said, well, you can be on the steampunk panel which I was like, why do I hate steampunk? <laughs> and um, the answer that I came up with after, you know, thinking about it and analyzing things was that I hated it because it um, supported colonialism. And um, so I was on the panel with Liz Gorinsky and um, Anne Vandermeer and um, Deborah Biancati and Michael Swanwick. I blame Michael Swanwick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was telling them this, and then I said, you know, this doesn't have to be this way. I will write a, a, a steampunk novel set in King Leopold's Congo. And Michael Swanwick went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I said, and I will make you beg to read it. <laughs> That's what I hope. And Liz Kerensky ended up being your editor. Yes. Your, ultimately. Ultimately. What, um, uh, it's such an elaborate work you talk about. You have 11 point of view characters. 11. Here. You span, I 
don't know, 40, 50 years of time, oh, really longer oh, maybe? Only 30 years. Okay. <laughs> Several decades. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you managed to pull in the, kind of the whole feeling of the world of the book going on around it. How did you pull off this? And you do it with like such kind of economy of words with sort of short chapters and without a surplus of a lot of like expository connective tissue. How did you go about kind of figuring out the structure that it had to pull that off? Well, the structure actually comes from my religion, uh, oddly enough. Um, originally, this is not how it's published, but um, originally it was in two pieces and each, uh, each section had 16 uh, chapters. And so um, there are, in, in my religion, I practice this West African tradition called Ifa. There are, um, in, in, we do a lot of divination and there are 16 uh, main um, verses that can come up in divination and they each have what we call two legs. And then, um, and then Liz was like, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Why did you divide these into two chapters? And I'm like, okay, fine. So, yeah, that's gone. But that's, that's how it came up with the structure. Short chapters because people have short attention spans, right? I agree. Yeah. Worked well with me. <laughs> how long did it take you to, to write this thing? It's, it's, it's been such a complex work. Uh, it took six years. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, of course, I was doing other things, you know, at the same time, writing other stories and stuff. But yeah, from the from the uh, the panel where I came up with the idea to when I was like, OK, Tor, could you please publish this now? I'm done. Um, six years. Wow. Did you learn any like notable new lessons about writing the other? Of writing this book? I don't know if I learned anything new. I certainly was able to put things into practice. Uh, there was some, there, there's nobody in this novel that's like me at all. Okay? Um, some people would say there's nobody that's like me anyway. But <laughs> I'm anticipating that. It's okay, Chris. But um, seriously, demographically speaking, no. So I had to write the other a lot. Do you have a favorite character? Oh, uh, Lis Lisette. Uh, yeah, um, because I modeled her after one of my favorite writers and a uh, heroic woman, Colette. Yeah. Do you think that uh, fictional utopia can help combat real world dystopia and injustice? Well, as long as uh, Michael Smanwick begs to read it, I'm, I'm satisfied. <laughs> um, but, uh, and he has read it, he does love it. Um, I don't know, that would be really, really great. Um, because it would, I think that the world that we live in is based in part on the world that we think we live in. And so if I can change how, how people think about the world, what the, what the thing, how they, um, if I can change the world they think they live in, then they can take it the next step. It's easy to write and sell dystopians. People love reading dystopian scenarios. Writing a, a, a compelling story of, a, of an effort in a utopian society is a harder and maybe more worthy <coughs> undertaking. Do you agree? Really? Um, I think it's harder, yeah. Um, I think that there are, are just like, Dystopias are, they don't take much imagination, right? I mean, where, where are we living, <laughs> okay? Um, but uh, there, it, there is, um, I think there's a, a, a good deal to be said for, for uh, writing utopias and, and uh, even if they're not uh, completely positive, they, they help. Right. Uh, audience questions? Did you go visit um, the Congo? No. I, I, I'm fascinated by the Congo. And I've never been on it. I, no, I, I haven't. Um, I did all my research with um, stills and books and online stuff, and um, I saw a couple of movies. 
and talk to people. Talking to people is how I research most of the time. Right here. So uh, with your research, what's the most interesting thing you learned or uncovered that you weren't expecting? I did not expect that there was a Chinese presence in that area. There actually were. Um, there were a bunch of people who were hired by Leopold to build a railroad from the coast to where the river became navigable, you know, basically up the falls. And they just, you know, one day they said, they looked at each other and they said, this is full of shit. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. And they headed east. Okay, that way, yeah. And they didn't get to China, but they did um, leave their imprint in uh, the cultures of the people that they settled with finally. So, yeah, there actually were really Chinese people there. I know. I, well, I, I, that was when I knew I had to have at least one viewpoint from one of those people. Yeah. In the back there? Um, uh, I guess it was a period of turmoil in the sort of time period that this is being written in. What made you decide, uh, out of all the socialist movements, the Fabians, uh, as opposed to, I, I guess, some of the more violent ones? <laughs> well, um, because uh, some of the writers that I really liked and knew about were, were Fabians. Um, That's what I assumed a bit. <laughs> yeah, because they were my, my homies. Um, Edith Nesbitt, E. Nesbitt, a children's author, she was, uh, she and her husband were founding members of the Fabian Society. And uh, next to Raymond Chandler and, and Colette, I would say she's a big influence on me. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, before anybody else asks any other questions, I'm going to be really rude and say that there's somebody here tonight that really means a lot to me. Um, my One of my former instructors at Clarion West is sitting in the second row and he is an outstanding writer who has shaped not just me but tons of people with the weirdness of his stories. <laughs> Our Bundrum. How are you? We had a great conversation with Howard here that Brad Denton conducted a while back that you can find on the on the on the stories YouTube site. Really entertaining conversation and reading of one of Howard's most recent works. But Nisi, it was one of my questions I had kind of thought about in advance was whether there was anything you had learned from Professor Waldrop <laughs> at Clarion West at, at Unnamed the Year uh, that was helpful to you in writing this beautiful book. Well, I didn't have I didn't have any of my characters um, receive information through dreams <laughs> because one of the more memorable things that Howard said was, "From now on, aboard my ship, there will be no dreaming," <laughs> which is it's just you know it's a it's a lazy way of info dumping. So, but it's also very well dropping as I learned when I recited that story to Howard because it's a quote from. Leslie Nielsen at Forbidden Planet. No <laughs> dreaming on my ship, said the captain. Other questions from y'all in the audience? Suki? Uh, yeah, is this a standalone, or can we expect some follow-up short stories, or anything like that? I actually just finished a follow-up short story, um, which is hopefully like sort of like a pilot episode for a, a sequel novel. Um, and I have one more to write um, the one that I finished is set on Zanzibar, which is an island to the east, and it's um, about uh, the struggle between people who are proponents of diesel and people who are proponents of um, palm oil. <laughs> and uh, then I have another one that I'll finish sometime in the next month. Uh, that will be set in Alexandria, uh, and similarly will be between people who are proponents of diesel and people who are proponents of solar power. Did you know there was a huge solar power project in Egypt? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, so why not? 
when? Like uh, it was um, like World War One. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you had any idea when you were writing this how you wanted it to fit in with the rest of your work. No. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I I didn't. Um, when I, I was think writing, it does from the parts I've gotten to read so far. Oh, good. Thank you. Because that's totally not planned yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. I have written three other novels, but oh. yeah, they have nothing to do with this either. Do you hope to get any of those into print, or do you have other work that's coming out after this that is in the pipe that we can get excited about? Uh, the, I have a short story called uh, The Mighty Finn that <laughs> is. Um, oh. <laughs> that is going to be in um, an anthology called Cyber World. It's a cyberpunk story. I have like a series of short stories set in an interstellar penal colony. Um, and this is one of the stories. And hopefully, I can gather those all up in a book at some point. Yeah. Without giving any spoilers, could you maybe just a yes or no, can you say whether the events in this book, in this tale, Affect World War One on your in Europe? Ooh. No, I can't say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Sorry. Any other questions? Are we done? I think we're done. <laughs> DC, thank you so much for sharing that with us. DC's going to be signing books over here, I guess, right now. So uh, uh, we'll adjourn. There are some refreshments. Back. Thanks to the fine folks at Malvern Books for thank you. hosting this event, and uh, thank you all for to, for coming. We even had people driving up from San Antonio, I know, in the I thirty five rush hour traffic. So, uh, kudos! Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nisha.